hello everybody and happy new year's we're going to start off our first video of the year uh, with this little kit that i purchased and i think i showed you a little bit about it uh, just briefly in the last questions and answers video that i did and what this is is an lc meter for checking coils and inductors and capacitors now the thing that's unique about this it's made by this company called Acel, or I'm, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, A-S-C-E-L, and it's made in Germany. And uh, you can order it from their website. I think it's ASCEL.com or something like that. You can Google search it. Um, but they also sell them through eBay. But to my understanding, I heard it's a little bit more expensive to order uh, through eBay. Um, but I checked their website and it was a little difficult to figure out to order so I ordered it through eBay um, I'll try to put the link on the video for it now the thing I liked about this as you remember we did do one of these kits uh, from this same company earlier this uh, last year and it was actually this uh, this little frequency counter with the replaceable modules that had the power meter and two different two different ranges of frequency counter and so forth and we had the, the kit itself was very good. It's a very good performer, uh, very accurate, great piece of test equipment for the price, but the case was definitely left something to be desired. And as you can see, for all of their kits, they basically use this same generic case, and then they just punch out the faceplate uh, specific to the individual kit. Hopefully this one will fit a little better than that last one. Uh, because I tell you what, the test equipment itself was good. I'm very, I use it. I really like it. That is my main frequency counter now. Now this one is a little bit unique. This may not be something for all of you because the capacitance meter is only rated to check capacitors accurately up to one microfarad. Now you might ask yourself, why in the heck? What good is that? Well, this really wasn't meant <clears throat> for testing great big electrolytics and so forth. This is actually a highly accurate capacitance meter for reading very low capacitances, like the, the mica capacitors and ceramic capacitors that you would find in RF equipment and so forth. That's always been an issue accurately testing those. I'm hoping this is going to solve that problem for me. Um, I do have my Sencor uh, Z meter, and it's pretty accurate, even down in those ranges, but this is supposed to be really accurate in the one picofarad range and so forth. And there is some mil military test equipment out there that you can get, but it's very old. Um, you would certainly have to make sure you serviced it and have some way of calibrating it and so forth. Um, it's expensive because it's rare. So this is really small, compact thing, and I'm hoping it'll work out. And again, the, uh, the inductance meter is just a bonus for that as well. It has a USB interface. It has software that you can use it on your computer, which is really nice because uh, there's a lot of things that you can do with this meter. So I'm kind of uh, excited to get it put together and test it out and see how it will be. Now again, this is for people probably that are into RF or into computers um, where you're using really small you know, capacitors for oscillators and so forth that you're checking for accuracy in the very small you know, picofarad range and nanofarad range. So uh, that's really what, what this is for. So let's uh, open this up and look what all the parts look like. Okay. When you get this thing, dump it out of the bag, be very careful because a lot of these tiny little components you can see here are just loose inside the bag. The bag is uh, heat sealed, so it's, you know, really you're not going to lose anything out of it, but just be careful when you dump it out because parts could go all over the place. Um, I use these little trays um, and just keep my parts in that. And actually, if you guys are wondering what these are, I have like a bunch of them. These are actually blanks from computer cases that sit in place of where the hard drive would be in the hard drive bay. These are, these are blank hard drive bay fillers. And when you take them out to put an actual hard drive in, you get these little plastic things. People throw them away a lot, but actually they work really, really well for little parts holders. And that's where I get them from. They don't cost anything and they work really well. So let's get these things sorted out and we'll go over what's in here. 
once you get everything out of the bag, um, you can kind of sort them out and you can see there's not a whole lot of components in this kit. Um, you can see just right here there's a few resistors, a few capacitors, some switches, uh, little things like that, a uh, couple of chips, no surface mount that I see, some header pins, and these are going to be for the display, and of course you have your display, and it's an LCD, I think it's an LCD uh, color like blue blue background light and strangely enough the circuit board comes in another separate bag and in there are more components which uh, includes a USB receptacle which is a type A I think or type B type type B USB type B connector a couple more resistors and a few more capacitors and there is a surface mount chip and they've already done the courtesy of mounting the chip for you so you don't have to do any kind of surface mount soldering which I think makes it easier on you know the folks who don't have the equipment for that because that can be really touchy the other thing if you just notice I took a resistor out of this uh, manual make sure there's parts can get hidden in every little crack and crevice that you might lose one so again be really careful when you unpack this as you can see just like with the frequency counter they really give you a really nice assembly manual very detailed it has a schematic uh, it has all the parts lists you can see it shows you how to use it uh, how all the different you know how to solder how, all, how the color codes for the resistors, just reminders for people that are new to electronics, um, how to assemble it, gives you all kinds of different, gives you a, a circuit description, description of, you know, theory of operation. So you can see this is a very well put together manual that comes with these. It's one of the things that impressed me about the frequency counter. Again, if that case would have fit better, that would have just been <laughs> awesome. Uh, they also include a, a, a CD with this PC software, and just a blank, just you know, just a plain disc. But it has a nice label on it. Comes in a nice case, and again, and it shows you that it's you know both English and German. So yeah, this is a. I really like these kits, and I love the way they, they're designed. I love their accuracy, um, how well they perform. So again, I purchased this, and if you remember from the questions and answers video, at the same time, I also purchased the uh, sweep generator as well. Both of them were under $100 each for the whole kit, and that's including the power supply and so forth. They're not very expensive, and you know, you try to go out and buy a high accuracy capacitance meter for low capacitance you can sometimes get into the thousands of dollars for those even for a used one they still demand that kind of price so um, if this works again uh, and I don't see why it shouldn't if it's anything like the last kit this will be a, a really valued piece of equipment and the other thing that's nice it's nice and small, so if you don't have a lot of bench space, it doesn't take up a lot of space. So let's go into the instructions and take the board out and see what we have to do to start assembling this. I have the instruction manual open, and with any kit that you're going to build, I highly recommend going through the entire instruction manual and reading it front to back before you even start or plug in your soldering iron or anything. Um, there's a lot of good information you'll pick up that you may want to know before you start. Um, now, once again, this uh, this kit's kind of strange because the instructions are so good that it, they're designed that even somebody that's an amateur that's just getting into electronics or to kit building, it helps them to understand how to assemble these kits. Um, let's get into uh, some explanations that so you have a really good circuit description that you can read through but you can see you have a whole two pages on how to solder which you know if you've never soldered before this is a really good uh, tutorial how to do it 
it talks about the different components. So it shows you how to properly bend the leads to put them on the PC board. It shows you the different types of resistors and how the color bands are arranged on the type A and type B resistors. It shows you a color code for the, you know, so you can look up the color codes of the resistors and identify them. It talks about capacitors, uh, the film capacitor, ceramic versus electrolytic. It shows you how to identify a capacitor and talks all about that, what a microfarad and a farad and all that is, gets into uh, tolerances. It talks about diodes. It talks about LEDs. These are really good instructions for a, a beginner in electronics because these are just a condensed version of just the very basics you need to know about components. It talks about integrated circuits and how to read the numbers of the legs, you know, of the pins. With the, you know, shows you the marker. It shows you which one is pin one and how you read it, kind of in a counterclockwise manner. Talks a little bit about transistors, crystals, inductors, and the color codes for inductors, relays. Really good stuff. Then it gives you general instruction assembly instructions um, the notes you know notes on constructing a kit so it talks to you about the, some of the common mistakes when you're looking at the labeling on some of the components this is all good stuff for any type of kit that you're going to build and it's strange because the only person that would really have a good need for this meter would be somebody who would know all this stuff already because this is really a piece of test equipment that's really not meant for testing components out of your stereo or something like that. These are really for precise low value components that you would use like in amateur radio or you know building kits and things like that. Uh, if we go on through here it talks about the kind of power supplies you can use, some troubleshooting, how to put the case in it, how to operate it, and you get clear to the end here. Uh, let's see here. And it gives you, where are we at? It gives you the system specifications on the last page. And the thing that's amazing is when you read this whole thing, and it shows you the actual resolution that is it it will measure capacitance down to one one hundredth of a picofarad or ten femtofarads I can't even put into words how tiny of a value that is that this can measure and it has a built-in self calibration uh, routine that it'll run to make sure that it stays accurate to that there is no calibration when you build the kit. It's designed to self-calibrate. Um, and the whole thing revolves around one very highly accurate reference capacitor. So as long as that capacitor is in tolerance, uh, and I believe this is the actual reference capacitor that they're using. I, I have to make sure, but um, as long as that capacitor is in tolerance, the, the, the test equipment will always be accurate. So it's a really neat little kit for what it is. And uh, again, always read the instructions from start to finish before you even start to assemble anything because a lot of times there's information in here that you're going to miss, especially if you're a first time kit builder where you're going along and installing parts and you realize that there was another part that had to be put in prior to that. So uh, case in point, the LCD can only be installed after all of the other components are in because once you mount this down, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to cover up all of the components that, uh, that are underneath it and you can't get in there to solder them or anything and then you're in trouble. You have to try to desolder that, which is very difficult. The circuit board is very thick very good quality. All of the uh, terminals have plated through holes. That means that the terminal, like the solder pad, 
goes all the way through the board. It actually lines the inside of that little hole all the way from this side to this side. So this pad and this pad are physically connected to one another with a copper plated through hole piece. So when you solder, it will actually flow all the way through that hole and fill in that entire hole on both sides and lock both sides together. Um, and you're not re relying on just the wire that's going through there to, you know, to make the connection. Very good design. So let's start out with our first components and start getting some things mounted up and ready to go. I have the uh, circuit board mounted up on my little circuit board holder and you've seen this in previous videos. Uh, this is something you can buy on Amazon very inexpensively. And I've just taken a little bit of uh, isopropyl alcohol or denatured alcohol, soaked one of these little swabs. My daughter turned me on to these because these are special uh, cotton swabs that are used for makeup, like putting on makeup. They're a lot more durable and they don't shed like regular cotton swabs do and they work really well for cleaning you know, putting putting uh, alcohol on, just cleaning these pads off, just the oils or any kind of gunk that's on there you don't want on these, uh, you know, on the cheap little dollar kits that you build and you're throwing together real quick, it's not so important, but since this is going to be a piece of test equipment, I'm going to try to be a little more formal about this and clean this, clean these off a little bit. So I've gone and cleaned both sides really well and I'm not going to touch them with my fingers so that the oil from my fingers don't get on there. I have my multimeter set up with my little adapter probes as, as you can see just a couple banana plugs with some stiff number 14 or number 12 copper soldered into them and I'm just using that to be able to identify these resistors. Uh, we can certainly look at the color codes but eighth watt and quarter watt resistors uh, are very tiny. Sometimes the the brown and the red colors and purple colors and orange colors kind of fade together. It's very hard to know which ones are which. So I found it a lot easier to just do this rather than trying to lay it on the, the table and chase it around with, with your probes. I just have this set up and you can just touch this right in there and hold it. And you can see that's a 220 ohm resistor and that should be red red brown and if we look on here I think it's red red brown is it not yep red red brown and then the gold means that it's uh, five percent tolerance so that's all there is to it so we're gonna go through and use that to identify the components if you look there is a method to the way that they assemble things here and that is they have a black and white layout of the circuit board and it shows you the components and it matches up with the silk screening on the board. Right next to that you have your bill of materials so what you're going to do is you're going to look up the designator for instance C1 it's a 100 nanofarad capacitor you go over to this page and you look up C1 which would be somewhere in here. I haven't even looked it up yet. And then you would place the component on the board and solder it on. Now, anytime you see a designator with an asterisk, you see the little asterisk over here. So there's an asterisk here, asterisk here, asterisk here, here, here. That means that this component or this switch, S1 and S2, these switches, are to be mounted on the opposite side of the board, on the non silk screen side. So there's a note, it's very tiny, but it says parts whose designators contain an asterisk are mounted on the opposite side of the PC board. Okay, so that's why I said it's very important to read all the instructions from cover to cover before you start to assemble. If there's ever any doubt of putting this together, they give you this full color pictorial diagram of what the board looks like when it's fully assembled. And you can see it gives you the silk screen side of the board, the solder side of the board, and then the side view with all the components mounted up. So this should give you an idea of what this thing looks like when it's done. So between this as a reference 
and this as your map to put things together, you should be able to get everything assembled. Now, in the instructions, when we go back here, it talks about to save PCB space, the resistors are mounted standing, which means instead of laying the resistor flat on the circuit board, you can see how they're doing this. Now, you can do this either with a little bending gauge, uh, like this, which lets you neatly bend it, or you can just use a pair of pliers, with a little needle nose pliers, which is more than likely what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to hook the leads around till it looks like this and solder them down in. So that's the process. We're going to test the components, get them on the board, solder them down. I'm using my small bent tip and uh, a chisel tip would work with some of these larger pads but when you get to these tiny ones you really want to have a smaller tip like a conical or a very very small chisel tip or a little bent tip it's just going to make it a little bit easier so you don't make little solder bridges um, I just touched that little solder bridges between the pads so I'm going to start mounting the components and then when we get a little bit of progress we'll come back as you can see, I have all of the components pretty much soldered on the board now. Uh, and there's a little pile of components here, and these are the ones that were in the bag with the PC board. Now what these turn out to be is these are the components if you purchased the USB model. In other words, if you bought the one that has the USB interface, it will come with a USB connector plus these extra components. They also make an RS-232 model and if uh, if you have that'll work off of a com port of your computer that's the old style serial port it would have a different combination of components and it would have a db9 connector instead of a usb connector so that's what those extra components were that were packed with the circuit board itself a couple other things you might want to note when you put this particular part to or, uh, kit together it says under the section about soldering resist the resistors. Uh, it says that the resistors are mounted upright to save space. Now on some of the kits, that that is the way it is. On this particular kit though, if you look, the way they're laid out, the resistors actually lay down on the board. And even if you look at the pictorial diagram they show the resistors laying down on the board not sitting upright so just so you know that um, don't don't get misled by that little instruction there that's just a little typo I think that's a generic thing they put in all of their instructions the other thing we're gonna have to do is I have not mounted the capacitors because they stick up and some of them run into my little jaws here the little clamps. So I usually put those things that are along the edge of the board, I put that stuff in last. We also needed to disassemble the banana jacks. They just kind of screw onto the end like this. You unscrew them, a couple little pieces, and at, after you do that, this will go on the opposite side of the board and you will solder it in like this, which that's what I'm going to do and then the little plastic cap will screw on from the outside of the case when it uh, when you put it into the case that's how that works so I just wanted to kinda give you a little tip on that so I'm gonna put the rest of these last components in get those banana plugs in and then we're going to put on the LCD display will come last we have to put this little header plug in here and then attach the circuit or the uh, LCD to that so once I get that done we'll be back all right we've got the board all assembled you can see there and there's the component side and there's the display side and we have the banana plugs put in there switches and that's pretty much all there is to it so uh, the final assembly is to put these little standoffs in here and then to push this uh, header plug up through the LCD display and then just solder all those on. So this is ready to uh, assemble and test. So the next step is going to be 
to fit this into the cabinet. And once I do that, um, I'll be back and hopefully this one will fit better than the last one. We'll see what happens. All right, good news. This fits together really nice. Uh, the only thing that holds this front face plate on is these two banana plugs. So basically, you take two, two of those two nuts and you screw them way down. And then you take the, the, back plate, the back ring and you stick it on there. And then you put this front ring on and it's threaded. You thread it down and then you just tighten the two nuts up against the back of it. You can see down in there. And, uh, and then just, they're kind of like jam nuts. You just use those two to lock against one another. That holds it on. And then there's a couple little recesses, little slots, one here and one here. So it holds the two boards. And uh, that's it. That's the assembly. The power goes in here, and I'll get a couple little wire ferrules with some wire. These just simply pop right into the back here and they'll slide right here and then we can just run a couple of wires through you know from here through the switch and up here and it should be ready to test the only thing left is these two little little knob covers and they're just tiny little sleeves little button sleeves and they go right here over these fronts like this and I'm kind of working around the camera just like that. And those just kind of give you some buttons to a little bit easier to push on. And that's it. So let's, uh, I'll get these wires put on and uh, we'll be ready to test it. And that's it. It's just as simple as that. A couple of wires. Um, one comes off the negative, goes into the negative terminal on the board. And these are just little screw terminals. You could also solder it on there, a wire, if you wanted to. I just crimped a couple of those little wire ferrules on there and put them in. Uh, so you can take it out if you ever need to disassemble it. And then the positive wire just goes from the other terminal of the jack to the switch. Comes out of the switch and into the positive. So it's just as simple as that. And uh, before we put the top on, I think we should probably get the power cord out and hook it up and see if this thing even boots up. Looking at the instructions on the power supply, it says that anything between 8 and 12 volts at 100 milliamps is all you need. It says do not use AC. It's got to be a DC power supply, obviously. And um, for an option, when you order this, it's not very expensive. You can actually add this part number, AE20204, uh, the little wall wart power cord, which is right here, and it's just a generic power cord is all it is, and it puts out 9 volts at 200 MA, 200 milliamps, and it just has one of these little connectors on the end. So that's all I'm going to use, but you could also use a uh, battery pack uh, with uh, AA batteries. I'm sure they'd last a long time, or get your own little wall wart or make your own little power supply. Probably as much space as in this case, you could probably mount the components to build build a little built-in power supply also, I guess, if you wanted to. But anyways, this is what I'm going to use. So we'll get it plugged in, connect it up, and let's flip on the power for the first time and see what happens. There it is. So that's it. Um, it booted up and I don't see any errors and I'm assuming that it's working now. So let's put the cover on and see if we can uh, get it to test some components. All right, I put this up on a little bit of a stand here so it's a little easier to see. And uh, for our first capacitor, I'm just gonna use one of these little film capacitors. And this is a 0 0.001 microfarad or a 1000 picofarad capacitor. And we're just going to hook it up to these. I have these little short little leads on here is all I'm using. Uh, the, it also comes with a pair of tweezers that were an option that you can uh, use for in-circuit testing, I guess. 
and you can see 925 picofarads and this is a thousand picofarad capacitor so that's pretty good so let's check one that is a and again it says right in the instructions that this will not test electrolytic capacitors this is only for non-polarized capacitors that are smaller than one microfarad so once again this is for testing very small value capacitors so let's look at a 47 picofarad silver mica capacitor. So here's a silver mica, mica cap. And I don't know if you can see that or not, but right there, it's 47 microfarad, I believe. Or I mean, <laughs> 47, 47 picofarad, I think. Unless I misread it. Yeah. So you can see it's bouncing right around 47 picofarad. And there it is, right on. Now these silver micas are very accurate. And these are capacitors that you would use like in, in the oscillator section of a radio. So some of these really old AM radios, some of the little, some of the ham radios like the Halicrafters that you saw me restore, things like that. They'll use this in like the oscillator section and things like that, and they have to be very accurate. And your method of testing them has to be very accurate. So that's what I, actually the main reason I bought this thing. So let's also look at a standard 47 picofarad ceramic disc. And remember, this is a ceramic, which could also be very accurate, but you can see there it is. And you can see it's 46 picofarads, but some of them, you can see, if you heat them up, they can change just from, you know, putting heat on them. This one's not too bad. So, there you go. Now let's get one, oh, let's see, that's pretty small. Let's go down to a 10 picofarad capacitor. So now you're starting to get where some of these meters aren't really accurate at all. And there it is, 10 picofarads right on the button, just about. 10.11 picofarad. And again, this meter is supposed to be accurate down to one one hundredth of a picofarad or ten femtofarads. So I would have to say, and of course we can go to the larger ones, this is a 0.47 microfarad and again that's well within the range of this tester. And there you go. It should be 4, 470 nanofarads. It's actually 499 nanofarads. Again, this is not a really highly precision capacitor. Here's a small 0.47. You can see a little tiny one. Is it upside down? Nope, there it is. At 63 volts. I use these a lot in when I'm restoring some of the uh, re old 1970s vintage receivers in place of the electrolytics that they used for that. You can see this one's a little bit high too, but that's normal. Okay, so it works. It works really well. Now let's look at inductance. So we'll switch it over to that. And I have some little mini through hole inductors. Let's see. For instance, this is a 10 micro Henry inductor. Just have a couple of these in a packet. Take it out. Let's take a look at this. So, eight point six eight 
micro henry's all right so that one's a little bit off and again i don't know what the tolerance is on these or anything like that i could probably compare it to some of my other test equipment let's see here 56 micro henry's here's a 56 i'll just leave it right in the strip because it shouldn't affect anything and it's reading 48.7 micro henry's so there you go now if you want to recalibrate this you just leave leave the leads open hold the relative key down for five seconds and now it's doing its self calibration and there you go go back to inductance once again And there it is, 50 micro Henry, 48 micro Henry's, and this is a 56 micro Henry inductor. So it's pretty close. And again, I would have to connect this up to a, another. Well, let's let's do that. Let's use the LCR meter and compare it to that one, the one that we know is good, and we'll see. All right, I'm using the same leads and I'm connecting it to the same inductor. Remember, it was reading about 48, 49 microhenries. And you can see at one kilohertz, this one's reading 57. So it's reading actually one microhenry higher. So they do not agree with one another. So I'm not really sure about the capacitance meter, how or uh, the uh, inductance meter, the L meter, how good that is on that one. Let's check this 10 micro Henry and see what it does. Remember, it was reading about 8.8, .8, I believe. I'd have to roll back the camera to look, but I, I want to say it was somewhere between 8 and 9. So let's hook this up. nine point four so that's a little bit closer um, eight point eight versus nine point four and once again this one has the benefit of being able to go to different frequencies and I'm sure and you can see there you go this is reading at 10 kilohertz now and that's closer to what this thing is so once again you have to look at the uh, the test frequency and we would have to read the uh, description of function is to see what clock they're using or what reference frequency they're using to test. If you go down to 100 Hertz, now it says 14 micro Henry's. So that's another thing you need to realize is that these meters definitely will give you different readings based on what frequency they're testing at. So Let's take a look at that next. All right, so we look in here, and the first thing that strikes me is that the test frequency runs between 15 kilohertz and 750 kilohertz sine wave. Whereas when we're looking at the this unit right here, the DT9935, it has 100, 120, uh, 100, 120, 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, and 100 kilohertz. So it can run from 100 hertz to 100 kilohertz test frequency. Now the test frequency is the signal that they use to ring the device and they kind of measure the resonant frequency and do a little math formula and that's how these devices test the uh, device under test. And when you change that frequency you have the that reactants can change with frequency so you have to understand when you're using test equipment and comparing it you have to compare them with the same test frequency so for instance if we go to that back to that 10 micro henry 
and we go back to the DT9935. And we switch it to coil and we go to 100 kilohertz. So that's going to be closer to kind of where this thing's operating. And we connect it up. You're going to see this 10 microhenry inductor may give us a very different reading. There you go, it reads at 8 microhenry. So you can see, and if I go down to 100 hertz, now all of a sudden it's 13 microhenry. So once again, understand the limitations of test equipment. Um, so is this a bad piece of test equipment? No, it's a very good piece of test equipment, but you have to understand the conditions under which you are uh, testing something. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is it may test one way with your meter, regardless of what test equipment you're using, but when you put it in the real world application in circuit, because of inductive and capacitive reactants, that device may re read differently or may give present a different impedance because the frequency that the circuit is working at is a different frequency than what your test equipment was working at when it tested it. So I hope that makes sense. All right, this is very interesting because this is from the theory of operation in the manual. And you can see where it says, note, the values of real capacitors and inductors are not constant, but depends, among others, on frequency. Measuring with different test frequencies will give different results. Now, remember what I was just saying. We kind of found that out just by our tests. And what I'm finding out is that the capacitance meter is very, very accurate. The inductance meter is always a wee little bit low and I think that has to do with the way that it calculates it. Now, if we move over here a little bit, and I know we're going to get to the software here in a second. If we go over to here, these formulas are actually the formulas that are programmed into the microcontroller um, and form the basis of how this test device calibrates itself and then how it can calculate the device under test. If we go back a little earlier, all of this is dependent upon a reference capacitor. It's a 0.5% tolerance, so it's very, very high accuracy capacitor, which is that C10, which I believe was the 100 nanofarad, I believe is what it was. And it uses a that precision capacitor to determine the exact values of the capacitor and inductor that forms the oscillator. So C9 and L1, and if we go here in the schematic, uh, let's see, right here, so if we look here, here's L1, which is the 68 microhenry inductor. C9 is a 680 picofarad capacitor. And then here's your C10, your high uh, it's a thousand picofarad. That's your high accuracy. And you can see the relays that will switch these either into series or parallel to set up an either capacitive or inductive test uh, setup. And it uses this to calculate the, the, these even if they're a wee little bit off. So it self calibrates this oscillator until you get the frequency that it wants. Then when you put your device under test, you're ringing it with a very accurate oscillator and then by measuring the difference of how that oscillator changes, the frequency of that oscillator changes, it can very accurately calculate what the value is of the device that's under test and that's how that works. Now once again, because of the way this thing's testing these little inductors that I have here, 
they're always reading a wee teeny little bit low from what the, re the inductors are rated at. And when I compare it either to the DT9935, I can get that same measurement by putting a high frequency test on this. But as I go to a lower frequency, it, it drops off. So what I'm trying to say, but when I use the send core, which is up here, and you can see my Z meter, it actually is within a couple of micro Henry's uh, in sync with this device. So, <laughs> have I confused you all yet? Um, I think that statement in the theory of operation says it best that the values of the real capacitors and inductors are not constant. They're not constant because they change with respect to the frequency that's being applied to them. So that's why, again, you have to understand how your test equipment works to determine whether the device that you're testing is actually r good or bad. Because you could accidentally throw out a part that's actually good just because your test equipment, uh, the, the test that, that it's applying doesn't match the test <laughs> when the thing was given its value. I don't know if that makes sense to you. So anyways, this is working and regardless of, of uh, you know, of any of that, the capacitance on this is really, really accurate. I mean, I can switch this over back to capacitance. Um, I can reach in here and just grab a random. Here's a 22 picofarad and these are pretty accurate these are ceramic, but they're actually pretty, uh, most of these are pretty close tolerance. So let's stick that in there. And you can see 22 picofarads within, within 0.9 picofarads. So like I said, the, the capacitance meter is fantastic on this. The inductance meter, like I said, I'm sure it's very good as well, but you have to look at what frequency it's using to test it. Now let's go one step further. And if I take that capacitor and I put it into the leads like this, okay, just like this, it's telling me there's another one. That's a 22 picofarad. This one's a little bit lower. It's a 20.43, 20, 20 still within tolerance. And I take my scope, and I'm just going to connect the probes right across the uh, device under test and you can see what it's doing it's applying a sine wave in there and if we do auto set you can see right now because it's a super low frequency or very low capacitance it's going to have a very high frequency and you can see it's oscillating at 722 kilohertz which is right around the maximum operating free clock frequency of this test device. Now if I go ahead and put, let's say we put a bigger capacitor in there, let me, let's say one of those, uh, let's say one of those 0.47s, if I can get one out of the little bin here, and we go over here, and I take this and all I'm going to do is I'm going to move these probes from this capacitor to this capacitor. I'm going to put you back on the scope so you can see what I'm doing. So we're connecting it back up. Okay, give me a second. Got to move everything over. All right, here we go. You ready? And you can see it's not even reading anything now. Because the frequency is so low, it's not even picking it up. So you can see hardly anything in there. But if we take that capacitor out and connect it direct, you can see right now there's full frequency 730 kilohertz and you can see I just have the scope directly connected to the test device 
without any any device in there so once again if I touch this capacitor on like that there we go you can see it swamps that signal right out because this is a much higher value of capacitor so look and you can see it swamps it right out so my scope can't even test it because the impedance of my scope is interfering with with it now if I go back to that little 700 or 22 picofarad capacitor and I touch it in there see what it does it just moves that frequency just a teeny bit see on off on off now if I take another capacitor this one's a hundred picofarad actually better yet let's do a 220 picofarad so we'll connect to 220 so now this one's this one is actually 10 times more capacitance than that 22 and you can see where I'm at if I touch that on now you can really see the change of frequency see what it does it lowers the frequency so the higher the capacitance you put in across the test leads the lower it makes your test frequency in the device. Does that make sense to you? Now, that's the way that this thing calculates capacitance and inductance. Whereas this one applies a constant frequency and then reads the frequency that that, that thing oscillates at. It's, it, does a, it tests it a little different way. I hope that makes sense. All right, let's look at the software. All right, this software is just about as simple as you can get. Um, really, the only reason you would probably ever want to use it would be to use the logging. And if you log it, you can see it'll keep a log of, if you want to check a capacitor uh, as it, changes with temperature over a period of time you can uh, obviously have a log file like this where it tests every so many milliseconds and then save that log file and then I'm sure if you're really creative with computers you could probably figure a way to get that information to go into another program to be read off uh, for some reason uh, as you can see, I have a 5 nanofarad capacitor in the tester right now. Uh, it's right down here. You can see it. And you can see just, and that's a very high precision capacitor that, I, that I'm using, and you can see how accurate that is. So again, the, this capacitor checker is fantastic when it comes to low-value non-electrolytic capacitors. That's what it's designed to test. For some of you that aren't into radio and things like that, this really isn't going to be a test device that I can recommend for you. Um, but if you're an amateur radio person or you like to do radio service, one of the reasons I purchased this, to, to be honest, is working on some of these old tube radios that get the silver mica disease, you can actually take the IF can out of the, the little IF transformer out of the radio disconnect one of the leads of the coil and I should be able to use this to very accurately measure the capacitance in there um, of those you know of those IF cans because oft times the capacitor that's in there doesn't have a value listed in the schematics or anything so this is another thing um, also if you're using a trimmer capacitor and you and you want to set it to a very exact value you can use this and you can use the logging and so forth. So again, this is more of a piece of test equipment for radio RF type people, especially old analog where you're not, uh, where you're actually looking at something uh, like a capacitor driven oscillator or something, or some of the older computer equipment that used, you know, oscillator circuits, uh, and you, you're looking at capacitors in there, any kind of stuff like that this would be great for it. So I'm very pleased with it for what it is. 
but I just want you all to know what it is if you see these out online that's what it is that's what it does this is how it works um, the software was very simple it was just a, a setup exe you ran the only thing you need to know is if you plug the USB connector in with the power on it will not activate the USB circuit in here you have to actually have to connect the USB to the computer first then flip flip the power on to the uh, LC meter and then everything will work just fine so that's about it for this thing that's a, getting to be a pretty long video on a pretty simple piece of test equipment but I wanted to do kind of a thorough review of it so that you all can see what it is and what it isn't so uh, it, it is not a full-blown capacitor checker that can check electrolytics and leakage and ESR it doesn't do any of that it just checks capacitance of very low small value capacitors if that's what you need it's a great piece of test equipment if it's not it may be something you want to pass on and uh, use something else so I hope this video was helpful and I hope you liked uh, at least was a little bit entertaining uh, as always if you like the video give me a thumbs up and I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And until next time, take care. Bye-bye.